Stories from the pages of time. Stories of triumph and tragedy, adventure and achievement as we go in search of history. Discover the home of ancient prophecy where philosophers and kings came to learn their fate. A shrine so powerful that it influenced the destiny of the Western world. She forecast the future, predicting everything from the outcome of wars to the fidelity of wives. Enduring for over a thousand years, the oracle at Delphi was said to have foretold the coming of the Trojan War. It was here that the democratic laws of Athens were approved, that Alexander the Great was declared invincible. Even the most uncompromising philosophers believed in the oracle's power. Plato, Thucydides, and men like that who questioned everything that came in front of them, trusted the Delphic Oracle to give them the word of the gods. Plato put an oracle modeled on Delphi in the center of his ideal city. And it was the oracle at Delphi who declared Socrates the wisest of men. The Greeks had many ways of trying to uncover the will of the gods. The flight of birds, the play of fire, even the entrails of animals were all interpreted for divine signs. One always tries to, to discover the will of the gods. You do it by omens, right? Thunder on the right means the gods like it. A bird flying in from the right means the gods like it. But at Delphi, one could get it from the mouth of the deity himself through his priestess. The word oracle has three meanings. It refers to the priestess who delivered prophecies, to the prophecies themselves, and to the place where the prophecies were made. The Delphic Oracle issued prophecies for over a thousand years. But where did the Oracle's clairvoyant power come from? According to Greek myth, Delphi is the exact center of the universe. The story is that at dawn on a certain day, Zeus sent two eagles flying, one from the east end, one from the west end, and they met right over Delphi. One of the symbols of Delphi is the omphalos, the navel. Uh, representing the absolute center of the world. Another legend tells the story of a Delphi shepherd named Caritas, who discovered a chasm in the ground that emitted odd vapors. When humans inhaled the fumes, they could see the future. The verifiable history of Delphi begins in the 16th century BC. 1,000 years before Delphi would reach its peak. Here at the lowest strata of these ruins, excavators found evidence of human settlement and also of a sanctuary for the worship of an ancient earth goddess named Gaia. An oracle of Gaia might already have been functioning at this remote time, issuing prophecies from inside this cave, about seven miles from the current site. In the 10th century BC, Gaia was overthrown by a new and more powerful god brought in by invaders from the north known as Dorians. The new god was called Apollo, god of reason, light, music, and prophecy. This 7th century ivory figure excavated at Delphi is one of the oldest images of Apollo ever found. The legend of the new god's conquest at Delphi is a bloody one. Apollo had to kill an enormous python that guarded the sanctuary for Gaia. In memory of the slain serpent and Gaia, Apollo chose a woman to be his high priestess and named her the Pythia. 
The first Pythia, also known as the Sibyl, delivered her oracles from this ancient rock. Eventually, the Pythia moved indoors into a hut made from laurel. This was the first of six temples of Apollo. By the time the first stone temple was built in the 7th century BC, the fame and influence of Delphi had spread throughout the Greek world. Plague, drought, famine, war, and virtually every crisis of state brought supplicants here hoping to speak directly with the gods. A city-state could not function without consulting Delphi for the founding of colonies, for the establishment of new religions, for changing a religion, changing a law. Delphi had to be consulted. Delphi had to sanction it. If the Delphic sanctuary broke down, so to speak, everything in Greece would have broken down for a while. Little remains to evoke the splendor and drama of Delphi in its prime. This is the ramp that the Pythia walked up as she entered the temple of Apollo and prepared herself for divination. This, the legendary spring of Castalia, said to carry waters of prophecy in which the Pythia bathed before she spoke. This, the sacred way along which the supplicants walked, once crammed with dazzling sculptures, monuments, and treasures from around the world. Overlooking all, the Sphinx, with its enigmatic smile, fitting symbol for the mystery of Delphi. The oracle wasn't the only reason people came to Delphi. This stadium once held spectacular athletic contests, the Pythian Games, second in prestige only to the Olympics. And this theater, the Theater of Dionysus, was once the site of the first arts festival of the ancient world. Dionysus, god of fertility and wine, was worshipped in Delphi along with Apollo. And every year, the mountains overlooking the shrine echoed with ecstatic secret ceremonies of his female devotees. Originally, the Delphic Oracle received visitors just one day a year, February 7th, the birthday of Apollo. But by the 6th century BC, demand was so great that the Pythia answered questions nine times a year, once a month from February to October. Despite great danger and expense, pilgrims poured in from the far reaches of the ancient world, Turkey, Northern Africa, even as far away as Gaul, modern-day France. It was so difficult to come to Delphi. For example, if you came from Athens, you needed a month and you had to cross all these mountains. If you had to come from the sea, please fight against the sea, against this weather, against everything. So you had to think first, should I go there or shouldn't I? It was the purpose of a lifetime to come here. Not everyone who made the long journey to Delphi got to see the Pythia. A privileged few were guaranteed access as a reward for some extravagant offering or gift. When the island of Chios, for example, presented this once massive altar to Delphi, the priests allowed Chions to go to the front of the line as this inscription declares. For the rest, the order of consultation was determined by lot. Those unlucky enough to be turned away despite their difficult journey had to wait another month and hope for better luck. Those allowed into the Temple of Apollo were about to experience one of the most dramatic and mysterious encounters of a lifetime. Think good thoughts and well-omened words the priests told them as they led them up the ramp. The first thing they saw inside, inscribed on the wall, was an aphorism attributed to the seven sages of the ancient world, Know Thyself, a startling and crucial piece of advice for those who had come in search of a prophecy. Remarkably, almost nothing factual is known about the women who served as oracles and whose prophecies guided ancient Greece. Innumerable visitors came to Delphi over a thousand years to receive their visions, yet not a single first-hand account of a meeting with the Pythia has been found. 
Visual evidence showing the Pythia at work is nearly as scarce. This small drawing from the inside of a cup is the only classical illustration of the Pythia at work. What is known is that the first Delphic oracles were attractive young virgins. One Pythia was either abducted by or ran off with a supplicant. Thereafter, only middle-aged women were chosen, ordinary villagers without inside connections or special gifts. That's very interesting because it means that they didn't want anybody of any importance to have this job. Someone with influence, someone with interest, someone well-connected. The Pythia only worked nine days a year, but the job of making oracles was uniquely demanding. By the 6th century BC, three Pythias were on hand to back each other up on busy days. It's not just a day's work to be inspired by the god Apollo and to feel Apollo inside of your body and to be speaking out the visions that the god has put into, into your mind. I think if we try to be a little bit of, have some empathy for the Pythia, we would see that this must have been exhausting work. Preparation for the job was largely a matter of ritual and psychological suggestion. At dawn, accompanied by two priests, the oracle bathed in the legendary spring of Castalia, believed to be a source of divine inspiration. Inside the temple of Apollo, she drank from another spring, also believed to have special powers, and piped into the temple through lion's head spouts. The supplicants, meanwhile, were making preparations of their own. They, too, bathed in the Castalia, and they performed a ritual to see whether Apollo was in the mood to answer their questions. The ritual was that you would come leading a goat to the altar, and you'd dump a bucket of ice-cold water on top of your goat. Now, if your goat was normal, then it would shake. And that was the sign, yes, Apollo wanted to answer your question. However, if your goat did not shake, just stood there, that meant Apollo did not want to answer your question. You would take your goat and go home and get no answer that day, and presumably come back next time with a new goat. By now, the Pythia would have come here, to a small room at the rear of the temple where she made her prophecies. Here was the original Umphalos, representing the navel of the universe. Here too, according to a common view, was a supply of laurel leaves which the Pythia supposedly ate to induce a trance. But apparently, laurel was not the source of her inspiration. Some classicists have gone up to Delphi and have chewed vast quantities of laurel leaves, have not felt inspired a bit, uh, but have got a very sick stomach because there's lots of prussic acid in laurel leaves. According to another popular scenario, the Pythia's trance came from vapors rising through a cleft in the ground under her seat the same cleft that the goat herder Caritas once found. When the French excavated Delphi in the 19th century, the famous cleft was one of the first things they looked for, but nothing was found. Things may have changed. It's, it's a tectonically active part of the world. There are earthquakes, there are landslides, there are you know, tremendous changes to the topography, and it may well be that something that was once there is now no longer there. Today, we can find no specific trace. Whatever the cause, the Pythia did go into some kind of a trance. When the laurel branch in her hand began to quiver, the supplicants were brought in, accompanied by a priest. He would serve as your intermediary. 
And the reports are that the, the, the Delphic priest would address your question to the priestess. And in response, you would hear something. And what the content of that something is has always been much debated among scholars. Until the last century, most scholars believed that the Pythia, under the influence of some kind of drug, shrieked out incomprehensible prophecies. A high priest at her side made sense of her frenzied words, writing down his interpretation of what she said. The Pythia was incoherent and wild. The priest was the real power behind the oracle. It's a plausible view. Delphi was an international crossroads packed with up-to-date information. The priests would have been extremely well informed about the world and able to make accurate and useful prophecies. It's a reassuring view that rationally explains the mystique of Delphi. But now, some hold differing opinions. The whole notion of the Pythia as the shouting, barking, crazed person seems to be derived from a mistranslation from Greek into Latin of terms used to describe this ecstatic, mantic state. In Greek, the word is mania or mania, and in Latin, this was sometimes translated as insania or vicordia, which means to be insane or mad or frenzied. Those who are skeptical of how this whole process works. Can't quite believe that Apollo gave real oracles at Delphi. They think that the priestess screamed or muttered or groaned, and then the priest would interpret her response to you. But there's no evidence for that. The Greek sources would simply indicate that it was an answer from the mouth of the Pythia that you yourself could understand, and that's it. You have received your answer to the question. One of the most difficult questions that the Pythia ever answered came in the 6th century BC from a rich king who wanted to test the Delphi Oracle. Instead, the Oracle tested him. Delphi by now was the religious and political center of Greece, a kind of capital city unifying the hundreds of independent city-states that made up the Greek world. It was here that the Greeks, often at war with each other, shared common ground. They came not only to consult the oracle, but to honor their gods, publish peace treaties, and tend one of the symbols of their heritage, the eternal flame. If for some reason the fire in your city became polluted, if it became corrupted in religious terms, what you did was put out all the fires and go to Delphi and have new, fresh, clean Delphic fire. It's the center point of all fire. Getting clean Delphic fire was a matter of utmost urgency. A runner named Eukaitis collapsed and died after carrying the flame from Delphi to Plataea, a distance of 100 miles in a single day. Obtaining a Delphic prophecy was not without risks. The Pythia could offer clues about the will of the gods, but understanding those clues was crucial. Nothing illustrates this more than the legend of King Croesus, king of Lydia, the most powerful nation in Asia Minor. In the 6th century BC, he sent emissaries to all the oracles in Greece and asked each one if they knew what he would be doing in exactly 100 days. It was a test. Croesus wanted to find out which, if any, of the oracles could be trusted. Of all of them, only the Pythia was unfazed. I know the number of the sands and the measure of the sea. I understand the dumb and hear him that does not speak. The savor of the hard-shelled tortoise, 
boiled in brass with the flesh of lamb strikes on my senses. Unaware of the Pythia's prediction, Croesus had, in fact, cut up a tortoise and a lamb and boiled them in a brass cauldron on the 100th day, something he thought no one, not even an oracle, would guess. Convinced of Delphi's power, Croesus sent lavish gifts to the sanctuary, 3,000 head of cattle for an enormous sacrifice, and a spectacular golden bowl large enough to contain 600 smaller bowls. He even sent his wife's jewelry, all in hopes of getting a favorable reading. Croesus was eager to expand his empire by attacking Persia, and around 550 BC, he came to Delphi to ask the oracle if this was a good idea. He got back the answer, if you cross the Halys River, a great empire will be destroyed. He thought, great, there's the green light. He went ahead and moved east and attacked the Persian Empire across the Halys River and was soundly beaten. Uh, and of course, the fault was his for misinterpreting the oracle and the great empire to be destroyed was the Lydian, not the Persian. Taken prisoner by the Persians, Croesus later sent his manacles to Delphi as a reproach to the oracle for misleading him, to which the Pythia supposedly replied, Croesus has no right to complain. Apollo foretold that he would subvert a great empire. Had he desired to be truly informed, he ought to have inquired whether his own or that of the Persians was meant. The story of Croesus is a good example of the way the Delphic Oracle operated, couching her answers in ambiguity that made it difficult for her ever to be clearly wrong, and conversely, guaranteeing that she would always be right. If the result is not what you expected, it's your failure to interpret it, not the Oracle, uh, which is at fault. The oracle's ambiguity was not just a clever way of saving face. People often came to Delphi looking for clear-cut, easy answers, for certainty, which they rarely got. The oracle worked by heightening their uncertainty, pushing it to a deeper level, forcing them inward for a key. About 70 years after Croesus, the survival of Athens, indeed the whole history of the Mediterranean, turned on the correct interpretation of an unusually difficult and ambiguous oracle from Delphi. By 480 BC, Persia had become the great power in the Mediterranean and was set to attack Athens with an overwhelming military force. Herodotus put the size of the Persian army at five million. Desperate, the Athenians sent two emissaries to Delphi for advice. The Pythia's response was chilling. Why sit you doomed ones? Fly to the world's end. The headlong god of war, speeding in a Persian chariot, shall bring you low. Rise, haste from the sanctuary, and bow your hearts to grief. Horrified, the Athenians returned the next day, offering prayers and fronds of laurel to Apollo, and vowing to remain in the temple until the Pythia softened her words. She did, but just barely. Zeus, the all-seeing, grants to Athene's prayer that the wooden wall only shall not fall, but help you and your children. It was an enigmatic, faintly hopeful oracle. But what did it mean? What was the wooden wall? Was it the wall around the Acropolis behind which the Athenians should gather to fight the Persians? Or was it a wall of ships? Was Athens' only hope to evacuate the city and fight the Persians at sea? After intense public debate, a majority of the Athenians voted to evacuate. Against incredible odds, 
they defeated the Persians at sea, a victory that laid the foundation of future empires. Those who incorrectly interpreted the oracle were killed when the Persians sacked Athens and burned the city, including the Acropolis, to the ground. The Persians destroyed and ravaged the entire city. But thanks to the Pythia, thanks to the oracle, most of the populace was safe on the island of Salamis, and the combined fleet of the Greeks was victorious. As a thankful offering, the Greeks sent a golden tripod to Delphi, supported by a column made up of three intertwined snakes. The column was taken to Constantinople in 300 AD, where fragments, including one of the snake heads, can still be found. The oracle at Delphi received visitors and issued prophecies just nine days a year. But the shrine of Delphi was intensely busy year-round. Much of the activity revolved around the strange relationship between two very different gods, Apollo and Dionysus, both of whom called Delphi home. Both gods were crucial to the oracle. Apollo was the dominant influence, representing reason, harmony, and control. But Dionysus, god of wine and fertility, provided a vital counterpoint. Both of the gods represent the same thing, and that is know thyself. Whereas through Apollo, you know thyself through introspection, through self-revelation. In Dionysus, you know yourself through the vine. That is, you drink and you go outside yourself. You experience yourself in a way that you wouldn't otherwise. Apollo ruled from February to October, a nine-month span in which he spoke through the Pythia. Dionysus took over in winter. According to Plutarch, a well-known writer and a high priest at Delphi, the division reflected the nature of man, three parts rational, one part mystical. Dionysus's female followers were called maenads, as in mania, and they celebrated his wintry resurrection with fiercely ecstatic and highly secret rites. Every November, 14 young women from Athens would join 14 young women from Delphi. Led by a pipe-playing boy who represented Dionysus, they danced up onto Mount Parnassus, seven miles high to the Corician Cave. It was the same cave that Gaia, the original goddess of Delphi, was said to have occupied and used for prophecies 1,000 years before. Dionysian rites revolved around aspects of fertility and sexuality, subjects about which the Greeks were not at all ashamed. On the island of Delos, for example, the worship of sexuality was explicit, and the maenads were reputed to carry phallic symbols as they climbed, drank, danced, and chanted themselves into a frenzy. It was real. The women went up on the slopes of Parnassus, this very rugged, tough terrain, and celebrated the Dionysiac rituals up there, which no doubt included dancing, sacrifice, some drinking, and so on. At the peak of their excitement, the maenads would seize wild animals, skin them with their hands, and eat them alive. The savage climax represented a kind of divine union with nature and Dionysus himself. Communing with the gods was not the only reason people made the long journey to Delphi. They also came to see the splendor of Delphi itself. 
Cities and colonies throughout Greece competed with each other here to display their greatness. Delphi, in many ways, I think of as a, a sort of permanent world's fair, with these pavilions almost set up by rival Greek states, uh, where the states are showing off for the benefit of all the other states of Greece. And so the very best examples of Greek architecture and sculpture would have been seen uh, as you made your way uh, up the winding road uh, to the temple itself. No less than 27 treasuries were crammed along the sacred way. Small but elegant storehouses like this one from Athens, once brimming with gifts. Very little remains of the wealth that once dazzled here. But in 1939, archaeologists excavated some bits of jewelry that hint at the extravagance. What's spectacular about it is that it gives us a sense of the lavishness of dedications that were being made in the mid-6th century BC. Most important are the chryselephantine images of Apollo, his twin sister Artemis, and his mother Leto. And this gives us an idea of art which we otherwise just read about in ancient sources. Only a few random samples remain of the thousands of works of art that once filled this shrine. The most famous, a charioteer pulled from the rubble with pupils and eyelashes intact. Monumental sculptures depicting whole scenes from Greek mythology stood atop the Temple of Apollo. Painting, too, flourished here, including a legendary mural with hundreds of figures so vast and complex, it included instructions for viewing. And music was celebrated as well. This inscription of a hymn to Apollo on the side of the treasury of Athens is a rare example of written music from classical Greece. Scholars are still trying to crack the musical code in hopes of one day playing the ancient hymn. Another major attraction at Delphi was the Pythian Games. Begun in 582 BC and held every four years, these athletic and artistic contests were second only to the Olympics in popularity and prestige. They featured a full range of sporting events, foot races, javelin, discus, boxing, and a vicious no-holds-barred form of fighting known as pancrotion. Chariot racing, the wildest and most dangerous sport in the ancient world, was also held here on a track that lies deep beneath these olive groves. The games were extremely popular, attracting tens of thousands of Greeks. Then, as now, alcohol was sometimes a problem. It is forbidden to bring wine beyond the dromos. This inscription on the stadium wall reads, if one brings any, then one must appease the gods and pay a fine. At Olympia, winners received an olive crown. At Delphi, they were crowned with laurel, the plant sacred to Apollo, and they were allowed to erect statues of themselves commemorating their deeds. A more significant difference, the Pythian Games included artistic contests, musical and dramatic competitions that were, perhaps for the only time in history, every bit as prominent and popular as the sporting events. You didn't necessarily have to be a great athlete, but you could also be a poet or a singer or a musician and participate in this festival. And this represents different aspects of Apollo, who was thought to enjoy these contests. This shows the Greek combination of things physical and things intellectual and things artistic, which I think in one way is not a bad way to define Greek culture. It got 
equal billing. Not everything about Delphi was admirable and pure. Over the thousand-year history of Delphi, the women who served as oracles were not always entirely trustworthy. There were occasions, to put it bluntly, when the Pythia took a bribe. In the fifth century BC, a Spartan general paid off the Pythia to give a damning oracle about a rival. When the bribe was disclosed, the Spartan committed suicide and the Pythia was cast from Delphi in disgrace. The scandal shocked the Greeks, but ultimately it was found that humans, not the gods, were to blame. Apollo is not considered at fault here, but rather his mouthpiece, the Pythia, was considered at fault. The manipulation is done on the human level, not on the divine level. A far greater crisis confronted Delphi in 480 BC, when the powerful Persian army prepared to sack the shrine. As priests began to hide precious objects, the Pythia stopped them with an oracle. Do nothing, she said. Apollo knows how to protect his property. That night, as the Persians launched their attack, a massive landslide decimated their troops. A few looters somehow made it into the sanctuary. Seven inscriptions on this wall announce rewards for the recovery of stolen treasure. Delphi's long, gradual decline began when King Philip of Macedonia and his son, Alexander the Great, conquered Greece. The Greek cities and colonies that had sent leaders to Delphi for urgent political guidance were now just pieces of a vast empire. Individuals still came to Delphi, but with private, relatively trivial concerns. They would uh, ask uh, who to marry, if uh, their uh, wife, for example, has another man, or how can they get uh, children, uh, or should they be afraid of something? Very simple things. The erosion of Delphi was greatly hastened by the Romans, who reduced all of Greece to a Roman province in 147 BC. The Roman general Sulla, needing money for a military campaign, decided to get it by plundering Delphi. His troops began to loot the sanctuary, but stopped when they heard music from an unknown source. Was Apollo protesting the theft? No, Sulla explained. The music was Apollo's way of showing how happy he was to help Rome. With the god's approval, the Romans stripped the treasuries of gifts that had piled up for centuries. Among other things, they took the enormous golden bowl that King Croesus had sent 500 years before. Too large to carry by horse, it was broken into small pieces and melted in Rome. Another Roman thief was the Emperor Nero, who came to Delphi in 66 AD and liked what he saw so much that he sent 500 of Delphi's best statues back to Rome. The mad dictator also competed in the Pythian Games and was crowned winner in the musical competition. One Roman friend of Delphi was the Emperor Hadrian, a lover of Greek culture who refurbished the shrine and revived the oracle in 132 AD. Once again, three Pythias were on call, giving prophecies to a new wave of visitors, mostly tourists from the Roman world. Hadrian himself sent a question to the Pythia, a literary question. Who was the real Homer, the man credited with writing Greece's first great poems? The Pythia's answer was that Homer was none other than the grandson of Ulysses, the legendary hero he wrote about in the Odyssey. Delphi's return to glory was brief. By the second century AD, the oracle was all but silent, displaced by a new religion and a new god. The early Christians, determined to wipe out pagan competitors, 
denounced Delphi, describing the prophetic trance in nearly pornographic terms as a kind of sexual possession by spirits from hell. A popular image of the Pythia as delirious and wild stems largely from these accounts. Remarkably, there was one final poignant flicker of interest in Delphi. Julian the Apostate, so-called because he was the last Roman emperor to oppose Christianity, longed to return to the religion of the Greeks, which he described as an adventure of the soul seeking God. In 362 AD, he sent an emissary to Delphi to see if the oracle could be revived. Apithia was still there, and she gave what proved to be the final oracle, announcing in effect her own demise. Tell the king the fair-wrought house has fallen. No shelter has Apollo, nor sacred laurel leaves. The fountains now are silent. The voice is stilled. Delphi was banned by the Christian Emperor Theodosius in 394 and destroyed with special ferocity. Not a stone was left standing to recall its greatness or fame. But the mystique of Delphi remained. Michelangelo painted this portrait of the Pythia on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Landslides eventually buried the ruins of Delphi under 20 feet of earth, and for centuries it was forgotten. It wasn't until the Renaissance that early tourists, guided by ancient accounts, made their way through the mountains and searched for the shrine. What they found was a village called Castri, built up on top of a sanctuary. Four centuries later, French archaeologists at Delphi dug their way beneath Castri and into the past, looking for something deeper than just buried ruins. They were on the trail of a dream, the eternal human dream to know the future. It was a quest that led those first seekers, as it leads us, in search of history. <laughs>